Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Let us come before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Jonah. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very disappointing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it, not, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what became of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, is it better for me to die? It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he was sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then go into the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual day, daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And then when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? 
Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. This will be, I think, short and sweet. This week around the church, we've had a storm of strange things hit. There's been construction, of course, and some issues there. There was a homeless man we were able to get into either Oliver Gospel or Transitions, but he had opportunities of both, and we visited both. There was a family facing eviction, and Family Promise is going to help and advise us there. There was a man we sent to Cooperative Ministries that is hopefully getting help through that organization and us. And there was even a dog abandoned on our property that we found a home for, and a tree that fell across a neighbor's fence. This on top of other events and things that you don't normally, they don't normally teach you about at seminary. Thankfully, there are people from the church who stepped up and helped. Thankfully, you've contributed to the pastor's discretionary fund that helped pay for things. Thankfully, there are places like Oliver Gospel, Transitions, Family Promise that have helped in these times. Yet, it seems unfair to have to deal with all of this until you stop and think how unfair life was to those people who were facing eviction or homeless or, yes, even the dog. All of us, as we get older, have stories that we tell of events or moments in our lives that shaped us growing up. Some are terrible, some are good, but some are just well stories. I'm guilty of retelling some of them because I'm in the job of telling stories that have shaped me and efforts to shape all of us, but nothing wrong with that. Jesus told stories. He made up stories. We called them parables, like the doozy we just heard today. The one we heard that has often many misunderstandings and questions. My story that I've told to you before is when I was around eight or 10 or so, and it was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and my father and I were walking down the parking lot from the church office area down the parking lot to turn right, to go around the education building, to go home. And across the street, there was a lawn. And in Lancaster, there's long, narrow lawns because it's row homes and they're all connected. But the point is, there was a lawn. And the grass on this lawn was very, very hot. And my father turned to me, and I can remember vividly, and said, Son, what does that grass tell you? Now, of course, I had a smart aleck response, thinking, you know, being me, but I didn't say it. I said, I don't know. He said, Son, that tells you that that lawn, they need someone to mow their lawn. Why don't you find out about it? So, I don't know if it was right then or soon, I went to the door, I knocked on it, a lady answered the door, and she said, Well, I don't own the house. It's, I rent from such and such a, a uh, rental office down the street. Uh, so I went down the street, I knocked, went to the office of this uh, rental agency, I went in there, before you know it, I was mowing that lawn, and another, and another. Before I knew it, I think I had five lawns on my list to mow for many summers. Work, my brothers and I were definitely taught the value of work, maybe taught it too well, I don't know. The other day I had to text one of the boys and I forgot what it was about, to tell you the truth, but one wrote back to me saying, well, work harder, Dad. He was being smart alecky, knowing that working harder seems to always be an answer for me to any problem. But when you work, you want to be paid fairly, right? You want justice. We know that there are always discussions about wages and minimum wages and people going on strike, what is fair, what is not fair. No matter what the answer is to these questions, we all, of course, want equality and fairness. Women and people of color and others have rightfully argued for equal pay, for equal work, which is not presently the case. So when we hear Jesus tell the story, we naturally get a little irritated. We agree with those early workers that this isn't fair. And you know what? By our standards, it isn't. So we are challenged by preachers and commentators and others to see what Jesus is getting at. We see the owner who says, wait a second, I paid you what I promised. Why isn't that fair? Are you stingy? Are you angry? Are you envious? envious because I am generous? Look how gracious and generous God is. And with our tails between our legs, we are asked to shuffle off. In reality, I think we are still often mumbling under our breath. It still isn't fair. Is it, even, it isn't even that generous. The pay that we all get, it really isn't generous. That they all get, it really isn't generous. The owner pays subsistence wages. He pays them just 
enough to survive for one day. It isn't like the owner helped the late workers get rich. He simply gave them enough to live on. If the early workers could see that, that is a matter of life and death for these late workers, maybe they, they would be moved differently, but they learned. They still think, I worked longer, I worked harder, I should get a greater reward. And it's so hard to get out of reward thinking. But one of, what if none of us receives an award? What if none of us is paid by God? What if what we get from God every day has nothing to do with what we deserve, but simply, rather simply, with what God gives? And even more important than that is, what if the reward is not that which we receive somehow on some imaginary payday? And I think all too often we hear this parable of some story about getting our eternal reward and how God is, rightfully, very gracious to even those people who come to God late in life. God being gracious to those Gentiles who came late or others who came late to God's party, last minute confession, anyone. God is welcoming even the latecomers and those outsiders. True. But what if the true reward isn't some sort of heavenly crown? or heavenly dwelling beyond? What if the owner of the vineyard is not so generous in the pay, but rather what if the generosity is in the fact that the owner goes back to the marketplace over and over to hire workers? Yes, he needs them. Yes, they help him. Yes, but, but he generously goes back to invite them to work with him with all in his vineyard. I mean, how much work are those five o'clock workers going to do? Very little. The joy needs to be in the work, not in the pay. The joy needs to be in the opportunity to be at work in God's vineyard, no matter what the pay. We do get caught up in pay. Sometimes in the church, we get caught up in how would this program pay off? How would this program, this ministry benefit the church? Rather, we are called to ask, how can I work in God's vineyard no matter what the pay? In our lives, we ask, how will my kindness pay off? How will my generosity pay off? What will I get in return? Look, God's vineyard clearly isn't simply the church. Rather, it is wherever God has planted you. It is wherever you find yourself called to live and work with others. And clearly, over and over again, we are reminded in Scripture that the fruits of the vineyard, the fruits of the harvest from us that God desires are the acts of justice and mercy and sacrificial love. Our acts of, yes, generosity and grace just like that owner of the vineyard shows. And while this parable, I grant you, is not a story about how we are to shape our economic policies per se, it is meant to shape our attitudes and our concerns as we do go about living in a world of economics and pay and strikes and all those concerns. Maybe, just maybe, we are called to be less envious, less jealous, more gracious. When someone receives enough simply to live on, even if they didn't earn it like we think they should have. The reality is that Jesus tells a story to mess with our expectations, our thinking, our vision of what God's kingdom looks like. God is not a good bookkeeper. In fact, God is not a bookkeeper at all. Rather, God is the one who calls us in grace and mercy to work for the good of all of God's vineyard. Even when that vineyard includes stray dogs. Thanks be to God. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. God, who is gracious and merciful, teach your church to invite and welcome all. Lead us to be grateful for the blessings of the community. Challenge your church to choose equity and compassion over judgment. Merciful God, hear our prayer. God, who sends the wind and the sun, you know every worm and bush by name. Help us remember that even the humblest parts of creation are precious to you. 
Show us how best to care for the earth and its creatures. Merciful God, hear our prayer. God who is ready to relent from punishing, impart your compassion and wisdom to legislators, judges, members of the military, law enforcement, and all. Give us all courage to serve our communities in times of uncertainty, stress, or exhaustion. Merciful God, hear our prayer. God who saves, direct your people who are tempted by evil ways. Protect your children from calamity and disaster. We especially pray for those who are victims of the recent uh, earthquakes and floods. Strengthen all who are incarcerated and encourage all who are in despair or pain of any kind. Merciful God, hear our prayer. God who is slow to anger, may we boast about the goodness of Jesus with the confidence of Paul in prison. Inspire us to find abundance in whatever vocation we are called to do in the world and service to our congregation. Merciful God, hear our prayer. God who abounds in steadfast love, we give thanks for the saints called to the kingdom of heaven. Unite them in spirit. Hold us firm as we labor in this life and look to the life to come. Merciful God, hear our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these in the prayers of our heart, trusted in your compassion, made known through Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may, may Almighty God, the God of compassion and love and grace, grant you forgiveness, grace, and peace this day and forever. Amen. Let us go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.